You guys ready to go into the word today? Check your neighbor right now. Make sure their amen is working. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Check their amen. Is, is everything working? All right. Now, let me, let me say this because when I ask you to say amen, it's not because I'm looking for affirmation, <laughs> although I'm still a little bit of a sucker for affirmation. But I'm not just looking for affirmation, but I'm, I'm wanting partnership in the word. I want you to co-labor with me. And when you begin to respond to the word, it opens things up in the spirit. And it, it causes a flow a synergy to begin to happen in the spirit. And there's an increase of the liberty of the word when you begin to cooperate with it. So I want to go today to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to preach um, a message that I, I felt like the Lord dropped in my heart early this week. It, it flows with all we've been talking about, but it's kind of um, focusing on one particular aspect. I want to preach today on sit down and... Speak up. Now, all your life, you've probably been told to sit down and shut up, right? Most of us probably heard that quite a bit. If you were as busy as I was as a child, I have not yet outgrown my ADHD. I'm still somewhat hyperactive. In fact, uh, yesterday it was funny because I was just pacing back and forth, just walking back and forth, and, and uh, Gina and the others, they said, well, why, don't, why don't you sit down? It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I got so much kinetic energy going on here. I just, I got to move. I got to move. When I was a kid, that was certainly an issue in my life. It brought forth many reprimands and even not a few whoopings. Does anybody in here know the difference between a whipping and a whooping? Yeah, I know the difference. I lived it for sure. Jesus calling, sounds like. <laughs> I know the difference because I... I was constantly having to be reprimanded. So now my parents never did say to me, sit down and shut up. They put it in other words. They were nicer about it. Anyone remember ever hearing when you were a child, children are to be seen and not heard. And so probably all of our life we have been somewhat trained that our voice is to be silenced, particularly when it comes from the enemy attacking your voice. Because Satan has one goal in your life, and that is to shut your mouth. He knows the power of the word of God in your mouth. He knows the power of praise and prayer and prophecy. He knows what breaks loose when you start opening up your mouth. When I open up my mouth, miracles start breaking out. I have the authority Jesus has given me. You remember that? When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority. Well, that's what the enemy is after, is the authority that you carry in your mouth. So I want to talk to you today about sit down and speak up. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll begin with verse 1, and I'll read about 10 verses that will give you tremendous context for what I want to talk about. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived. Following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of the flesh and senses. Now that word senses there is literally mind, mindset, way of thinking. So we followed the passions of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. Look at verse 4. Here's some good news. But God, who is rich. I heard a preacher one time preach for over two hours on those two words. But God. Yeah, his name was Bishop Morris Golder from Indianapolis, Indiana. He was about that tall, and brother, he could preach the paint off the wall. And I promise you, for two hours, we were listening to every word. It was amazing. But, he'd say it like this, but God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Okay, catch that. Made alive. You were resurrected with Christ. 
by grace you have been saved, and raised us up. Catch that one. You were made alive, then you were raised up, ascended with him, and then seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus, or literally, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Now, I want you to see what Paul says God has done for you. You were dead in your sins and trespasses, but he made you alive. When did he do that? When Christ rose from the dead, you were made alive. You weren't even born yet. But in advance, in Christ, you were made alive in Christ. Now, when you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you believe it, you are believing that fact. You're believing that that is true. And when you believe that you were made alive 2,000 years ago, and in one sense before the foundation of the world, but when you believe that you were made alive in Christ, something happens in your human spirit. You come alive. You actually come alive because you've now come into alignment with God's truth. The lie that you once believed when you were dead in your sins and trespasses is now broken off your spirit and you come alive in your human spirit. Your human spirit is now infused with the spirit of Jesus Christ and the spirit of God inside you breathes as he did in the beginning with Adam. <sighs> He breathes the breath of life into your human spirit and you come alive in Christ. But the next thing that has to happen, because a lot of believers know they are alive. They know they have been made alive in Christ and they rejoice and celebrate in the free gift of salvation that they have been given in the resurrection of Jesus. But Jesus didn't stay camped out around the tomb. But rather, he was raised up by God the Father, as he says in Ephesians chapter 1, and made to sit at the right hand of God. So in other words, Christ ascended. Now this is where many Christians fall short of the purpose or the destiny for which they were created. They know they're made alive in Christ, but they don't understand the ascended life. They don't know what it's like to actually be raised up or elevated in their self-awareness, elevated in their awareness of who they are and where they are with Christ, so they always stay pressed down. D, pressed. <laughs> Am I preaching to real humans in the room today, or is this an innumerable company of angels? I want to know if there's anybody in the room that has ever been depressed, pushed down. You know you're saved. I'm saved, I'm saved, and I'm so glad about it. I found the joy of my spirit crave. It is so real that I could never doubt it. Oh, praise the Lord, I know I'm saved. Boom, 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 boom. Don't make me dance now. I'll break out. I'll do y'all Pentecostal karaoke before this day is over. There's a lot of people know that they are saved. They know that they've been resurrected, but they've never learned to live in the ascended life. They've never learned to be raised up with Christ. But then when you begin to realize that you're raised up with Christ, there is a, a further stage of authority that has to happen. Not only are you elevated in your awareness that you now live from heaven into earth. Did you get that? 
You're elevated in your awareness that you now live from heaven into earth, which means I don't allow the circumstances of earth to determine how I live. But rather, when I'm in earthly circumstances, I come up into the heavens in my awareness, and I realize that I am looking at the situation from heaven's point of view. And when I begin to look at the world from heaven's point of view, I'm looking through the windows of heaven into the circumstances of the world, and I'm thus bringing to bear upon worldly circumstances the reality of what heaven says is true. I know what the bank says, but what does heaven say? I know what the doctor said, but what does heaven say? I know what the marriage therapist says, but what does heaven say? Mm, Somebody help me preach. I know what my neighbor says. I know what my, my enemy says. I know what my my husband or my wife says, I know what my mother-in-law says, I know what, I know what the world, I know what the news is saying, I know what CNN is saying, I know what Fox is saying, I know what MS, uh, MS, how do I say it? MSNBC, I know what they're saying, you can tell I don't watch them because I can't remember how it goes. <laughs> I know what the world around me is saying. I know what the headlines are saying. I I used to read the Drudge Report all the time. I haven't read the Drudge Report in probably 10 years, but I used to read it all the time, and every day I'd be checking on the headlines. Now I use Apple News, and I open up my phone every morning, and I got my headlines of all that's going on. I know what the headlines are saying, but what I want to know is what are the heavens saying? Because if I can get in heaven's perspective and heaven's point of view, then I can begin to live from a raised up position. But there's a third position or stance I must come into, and it is to be seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Now, this is about your authority. This is about coming into the throne upon which you were destined to be seated with Christ. Now, you may not know that, but Jesus says that he that overcomes will I Give to him to sit together with me in my throne and in my father's throne. What is Jesus saying? He is saying that you are meant to have rule or dominion over the domain or the area of influence to which God has assigned to you. This means there is an authority that is given to you within your areas of domain. And God wants you to come into your authority so that you can be seated with Christ in heavenly places. Now, this idea of being seated here has nothing to do with lounging in a lazy boy. Oh, I just think I need to find me somewhere to sit down. I'm just so exhausted. I believe I'll rest right here and put my feet up. Now, that's the way some people think when they think about being seated. They think that it's a posture of relaxation. But in reality, it's exactly the opposite. Now, of course, it is resting in the grace of God. But it is actually an official position like a judge who comes out of his chambers, enters into the courtroom, ascends the judge's bench, and then is seated upon the dice. He is seated upon what used to be called the bema or the judgment seat. He is seated in the judge's bench. Wearing the judge's robes with the judge's gavel. Now that judge's name may be Bill Smith. And in every other area of life, that's just Bill. But when Bill comes into his courtroom and is seated up on the seat of his judge's authority, he's not just Bill anymore. He's now the judge. He's now your honor. He's now suddenly operating in an authority that is bigger than him. Check your neighbor's amen. I don't think it's working. I want to know if anybody in the room would like to live with that kind of authority. Where you find the throne or the seat upon which you are called to sit. And you come into your authority. And you begin to exercise authority in the area of domain that God has given to you. Where when you speak, demons flee. When you speak, sickness evaporates. When you speak, poverty is broken. When you speak, the power of evil is shattered and scattered. 
scattered because when you speak, you are speaking more than as Bill or Bob or Jim or Joe or Sally or Susie. All of a sudden, you are speaking from an authority that when you begin to release that authority, the earth trembles under the weight of heaven's decree. There's some of you been playing freeze tag with the devil and he's been chasing you all over the playground, terrifying you every morning when you wake up. You live with anxiety that does not belong to you. You live with fear that is not your inheritance. You live with a sense of foreboding and impending disaster that Satan can manipulate you and control you. He can drive you into the corner and make you cry like a little baby because Because he's learned where your buttons are and he knows how to pull your strings. I'm preaching to somebody in the room today that is sick and tired of being manipulated by evil power. And you are ready to come into the throne upon which you were destined to be seated. And to enter into your authority and say no more, no more, not another day. You don't get by with it anymore. In the name of Jesus, I Bind every evil spirit. In the name of Jesus, I cast out every lion. Somebody help me preach right now. In the name of Jesus, I cast out every lion devil. In the name of Jesus, I break every spirit of addiction. In the name of Jesus, I shatter the power of the spirit of poverty. And I say that my generations do not define me. My genetics do not define me. My family history does not define me. But I have found my seat. Now, I need to talk to you about assigned seating. Six times, I'm sorry, five times inflation. (laughs) Five times in the book of Ephesians. (laughs) Paul talks about the heavenly places. Five times. The one you're probably most familiar with is either the one we just read, seated together with Christ in heavenly places, or you might even be more familiar with Ephesians chapter 6. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and to put it as the NRSV puts it, against the spiritual forces of evil In the heavenly places. King James says high places, but it's actually the very same word that we just read in Ephesians 2. Made to sit together with Christ in the heavenly places. It's the very same word in the Greek. So the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It starts, the first mention of the heavenly places, Ephesians 1 and 3. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Did you know that? You rich. You're much richer than you even know. You have been blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. When I was a kid, they used to sing, I'm rich in faith and hope and love. I got more than my share. And I'm moving way over to my mansion in glory where I'm a rightful heir. I told y'all, it's karaoke morning. <laughs> On Wednesday night when we do prayer service, we jokingly call it prayer Because we have an open mic for prayers. You're rich and you don't know it. You got a million dollars in the bank and you don't know it. Wouldn't it be a shame to live for all your life in poverty, only to find out that when you were a child, you had a rich uncle that died and put a, a billion dollars in a bank account in your name and you never knew it. And your whole life you lived without knowledge of what you had. Wouldn't that be terrible? Who besides me would be slightly disappointed? (laughs) Exactly. And yet that's exactly how we live in the spirit. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And then the second time he mentions it is down further down in chapter 1 where he says that God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. 
far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age but in the age to come, and has put everything under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. That's the second time it's mentioned. Christ is seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. Third time is the one we read in Ephesians 2. We are seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. The fourth time it's mentioned is Ephesians chapter 3, where he said, so that through the church, listen closely, so that through the ecclesia, the manifold wisdom of God might now, not after the second coming, but might now be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now, did you get that? We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Christ is seated in the heavens above all of the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. We have been elevated up with Christ into that place of authority. So where are we? Above principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Why? So that through the church, God can display his manifold wisdom or multifaceted wisdom through the church. To whom? To the principalities and powers. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual forces of evil where? In the heavenly places. Now, this is what I've been talking to you about that I've been calling dominion displacement. Because when Paul thought about what we would call evangelism or the preaching of the gospel, Paul did not think of evangelism as merely helping an individual get saved so they can avoid hell and go to heaven when they die. Well, certainly evangelism includes the salvation of the individual because that's the only way the kingdom comes in the world is through the individual, the transformed heart. But Paul never for a moment believed that was the end of the matter. He believed that was the beginning of the matter. That a transformed, redeemed individual would then become a, a, a mediator, if you will, or a, a, um, a channel through which the authority of Christ's rule would then be mediated into the earth. In other words, Paul believed that as Christians were added to the body of Christ, as believers were added to the body of Christ, that everywhere they went in the world, they whose life, whose body, whose money, whose time had once been given over to serving the dark powers of the principalities and powers, people who had once served the false gods of the nations, the principalities and powers, were now translated from the kingdom of darkness into to the kingdom of his dear son and where once their life was lived under the power of darkness they would now live in the authority of the light and thus the light would displace the darkness paul believed that by the saving of individual believers the roman empire and all the surrounding nations of the earth would be invaded by the light of the gospel until the light of the gospel would begin to shift the balance of power and the gods of the nations that had once dominated enslaved humanity would be cast out displaced pushed out of their seat in the heavenly places and that believers would come into those positions of authority and that believers would become the influencers of the nations. Did you get that? Did did y'all get what I just said? It was a mouthful, but did you get it? Paul believed that believers had been given the authority in Christ that had once been handed over to the princes of the earth, the principalities and powers at the Tower of Babel. But Paul said in Colossians chapter 2 that when those princes of the earth, those fallen angels that were the gods of the nations, the prince of Persia, the prince of Babylon, the prince of Tyre, the prince of Sidon, the prince of Greece, the prince of name Egypt, name all the, name all the different principalities of the earth. When Jesus ascended into heaven, Paul said in Colossians chapter 2 that he 
disarmed the principalities and the powers. He took their authority and he made a public spectacle of their defeat and their humiliation. And he ascended far above the heavenly places into the heavens that he might fill all things. Fill all things with what? With the glory of the Lord. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, let the earth be filled with the glory of the Lord. That the knowledge of the glory of the Lord should cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And he doesn't mean after Jesus comes again. He means right now, Christ in you. Christ in you, say it with me, Christ in you, the hope of glory. He meant for the glory of God to be released in the earth as you find your seat of authority and come into the place of dominion that God has given you. Yeah, I'm talking about evil powers that have dominated your family. But if you will take your seat, those evil powers have to go. I'm talking about generational spirits that have dominated generations of your family. Who in this room besides me knows that there are sins that have been generational within your family, iniquities that took root within your family? I know from my, from my own experience, my father, for example, he was, he was born into a family line of men who were famously immoral, immoral or infamously immoral. They were, in fact, there were even many of them that were pedophiles and abusers of children. So my father was born into a family line of very corrupt. I even had a bunch of great uncles that were a bunch of nudists. They would go to camps and run naked in the woods. Now, these were not people that you wanted to see. <clears throat> running naked in the woods. I saw them fully clothed and the thought, thank you very much, of seeing them otherwise brought upon me much dismay, fear, and confusion. They were immoral. They were, they, they, they were oh, swingers. They loved sexual orgies. They were into all sorts of unfaithfulness. My Father's father was a pastor who also two times while pastoring had affairs and ended up being publicly exposed for immorality. One of those times when my, was when my dad was in the Navy and wasn't even following the Lord yet. And yet my dad made a commitment. When in the Navy, when he married my mother at 20 years old, he made the statement to the Lord, even though he was not yet following Jesus. He said, Lord, when I get married, I'm going to be a faithful man. I am not going to be unfaithful to my wife. And my dad broke a generational spirit that had worked for as many generations back as our family stories can remember. And he broke it. And my dad never committed adultery. He never ran around on my mother. He was married to her until he died in April of 2018. He was married to her in faithfulness. And can I tell you that because my dad broke that before I was ever even born, that's one particular spirit that by the grace of God I've never had to battle. I mean, besides the fact that I know Gina would kill me and cut me up in little bitty pieces and scatter me all over the ground. No, I'm kidding. I actually, I actually, it's just one of those things that I've never, I've wrestled with different temptations and different tests, but that's never been one. Why? Because my father found his seat. He found a place of authority in his life that took authority over an old principality, if you will, over an old evil spirit that had somehow become enthroned within my family generations but my father said no more and I'm preaching to somebody in the room today you have an assigned seat there is a chair with your name on it and God wants you to enter into your authority now y'all do know we're gonna have to come back and preach about this some more right but just to give you hope that lunch is on the horizon I'll talk more about that later and everyone say, thank you, Jesus. You know you're happy. Go ahead and act like it. But I do need to say this. There are four corners, if I can say it this way, to the seat of your authority. 
to the domain that you have been given. Four corners. You ready? The first corner is your heart. If you are going to find the seat of authority where Christ wants you to be seated with him in heavenly places, that displaces principalities and powers that have worked within your family line or within your neighborhood or your community or wherever, wherever the Lord assigns you. If you want to discover that authority, it must begin within your heart. If you do not submit to the authority of Christ and allow him to become Lord of your heart, it doesn't matter what other authority he may give you. You will always corrupt it. You'll end up corrupting that authority because the heart is not made whole. This is what God is calling us to, every one of us. And so this is why my prayer is, and I think it is your prayer as well, Jesus, be the Lord of all, all the kingdoms of my heart. Be the Lord of my thoughts. Be the Lord of my mind. Be the Lord of my emotions. How many need Jesus to become Lord of your emotions? Yes, Lord. Become Lord of my emotions because my emotions lie to me. Ooh, I got some lying emotions. Everyone says fear means false evidence appearing real. Gene and I have changed that. We say false emotions appearing real because fear always begins in lying emotions. So Jesus, start with my emotions, Lord. Get in my emotions and then move into my will. Ooh, anybody besides me got a strong will. I got one hand in the air right now. I want to know who else besides me. Yeah, there's two hands, one foot back there. It's like, you better believe I got a strong will. Now, that strength of will is a good thing. I just need it yoked up with Christ. That strong will is a positive thing if that will can be harnessed to Christ and come into alignment with his will. And then I need him to move in my mind because my mind plays tricks on me. My mind is a cruel prankster. I've had whole conversations in my mind that never even happened. I told Gina before, it's amazing what she and I have gone through that actually never happened. Experiences that we lived through that never happened. But in our imagination they happened and our mind played tricks on us. So I'm saying... Your domain, your dominion, your authority starts the first corner of your room or your place in the Father's house where God has given you an assigned area of influence. The first area is your own heart. The second is your house, your family. Lord, I need you to move in my family. I need, as Gina and I rule and reign together within our household and we see our children come up within our house, Our prayer is that our home will become a fortress, a stronghold of the kingdom of God. That within our house, no evil spirits have permission to enter. I remember once when Gene and I first, right after we first got married, we had just experienced the death of our first child. And it was a a very devastating experience. And I remember it was about one in the morning. Gene and I had been talking, praying. She was going through a very, very difficult time uh, in, in her life and a whole other situation that was related. And I'd, we'd been talking. She went to the guest room in the house where we lived then to pray. And I went and I just uh, I lay down across the bed and was just kind of lying there. And I heard her prayers. The tone changed. And it became very tormented. And I came awake. I'd kind of drifted off to sleep. I came awake and I realized that there was an evil spirit in that bedroom torturing her, tormenting her. And I, almost like Superman. In a single bound. It wasn't, it wasn't across a tall building, but it was completely across the room. It was as if I just jumped straight into the middle of the living room from our bedroom. And very quietly, she never even heard me. But very quietly, I told that spirit, I said, you have no authority in this house. You have no permission to come into this house and torment my wife. How dare you? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get out of my house. And it was like a wind went by me. 
and immediately, without her even knowing I was standing there praying, her prayer went from a tortured, high-pitched prayer immediately into a place of peace and rejoicing. And her prayer shifted, and that spirit was broken. Now, I'm telling you, we have authority. And as we rear up our children and we give them their domain, like, say, their bedroom, for, as they get older, for example, uh, Nicholas and Christopher both have their own bedroom. We begin to respect their authority. Why, what are we doing? We knock on the door before we go in. Why? Because we're training them to have dominion and authority in their own space under the canopy and the covering of our authority. And we're training them to come up into authority. Now, obviously, there's limits to that. There's certain things that can't be brought into the house, certain things that can't be done in the house, and there's certain things that if you do even in your room, we will come through the door even without knocking. Right? Because we're trying to train authority here, but we've got to have authority in our homes. Third area, church. Every believer is placed within the body with particular authority that you have been given in the body of Christ. And it is important that as a believer that you find the role you play. Now, for some, it's an actual position of leadership. Maybe you serve on a team or you lead a team or maybe you have a particular calling to ministry, fivefold ministry or an elder or a deacon, and you actually serve in a position within the ecclesia. That's wonderful. But even if you don't have a position within the ecclesia, you still have a role to play in what you contribute to the koinonia of the body, to the health or the well-being, the fellowship of the body through the gifts that you carry. And the gifts of the Spirit are operating within you for the good of the body, to build the body up. That's the third area. We'll talk more about it later. The fourth area is your world, your field, your metron. This is the area of influence that God has assigned to you outside. Now, what God is calling you to do today then is he's calling you to come into the seat of authority where you begin to recognize the authority you have over your own heart so that you can speak to your own emotions and say, Yea, I say unto thee, nay. No, you don't get to think like that. You don't get to feel like that. You don't get to desire that. No, in the name of Jesus, by the power of the blood of Christ, I take authority in my own heart. Do you know what would happen? I don't have time to preach this, but I'm going to say it. Do you know what would happen in your life if you begin to step back and become an observer of your thoughts? Rather than owning every thought that goes through your mind. Just because a thought comes passing through doesn't mean it's mine. And if you can back up and observe that thought and say, well, not true. I don't believe that. Move along. Nothing to see here. Move along. Move along. And you exercise your authority over your own thoughts. Okay, let me wrap it up with this. Sit down and speak up. When you find that seat of authority, what begins to happen is you begin to learn how to use your voice. And through praise, prayer, and prophecy, you begin to speak into your world and release the authority that you have been given. Now, your words create your world. You have to understand that God created the cosmos. He created the universe through the power of his word. And everything that exists, I don't care how substantial you think things are. Actually, quantum physics teaches us and quantum mechanics teaches us that there's actually nothing solid to anything. But that everything is actually information. Now that'll blow your mind. It's like, well then how is this chair holding me up? It's data, it's information that actually forms what we call matter and becomes solid. So therefore, everything has been created by the word of God. So when you begin to speak God's word into your world, you begin to recreate the matter of the world around you and you begin to reshape and reform you begin to speak with authority over your life it is time for you to learn to sit down and speak up Nicholas come and give these people hope 
Bartimaeus, sitting on the side of the road, wrapped up in beggar's garments, the garments that identified him as one who made his living by begging for alms, identified by his disability, identified by his poverty, identified by his lack. And yet as he is seated on the side of the road, he hears clamor and chaos and noise coming his direction. And he says, what's going on? Jesus of Nazareth is passing through Jericho. And Bartimaeus decided it was time to speak up. And he began to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And when he cried out, what did the people around him begin to do? His cousins, his siblings, all his family down at the family reunion that knew him since he was a little boy. All the people in his world, what did they begin to do? Sit down and shut up. Sit down and shut up. And this is what the enemy's been trying to do to you because he knows you're coming out. He knows you're emerging. He knows you're rising up. He knows you're coming into a place of authority where you're not just going to be a spectator as the devil just whips frenzy and chaos through your world anymore. But you're going to begin speaking praise, prayer, and prophecy. You're going to start speaking from your throne of dominion. And I promise you right now, when you begin to speak, the first time you start trying to speak, he'll try to make you feel silly. He'll try to make you feel disruptive. He'll try to make you feel like you're just causing way too much trouble. Sit down and shut up. But Jesus heard the cry of Bartimaeus. And he said, who's calling me? And they said, oh, it's the blind man over in the corner. You see all those people over there telling him to sit down and shut up. The more they tell him to sit down and shut up, the louder he gets. The more they try to drown him out, the more he screams through the noise. That's you. And Jesus says, bring him to me. But I want you to see what happened. When Bartimaeus got up, the Bible says that he shook off his beggar's garments and left them in the dust behind him. I need somebody here today to shake off an old mindset. I need somebody to shake off an old intimidation, an old spirit of fear, and to say, no, 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 no. In the name of Jesus, I'm dropping off my past. I don't care what you've been through. I do care, but you know what I mean. It doesn't matter what you, well, yes, it actually matters, but it doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter how you've been abused, how you've been misunderstood, how you've been mistreated. I know the devil's trying to tell you that you're so shaped by your past, you can never emerge from it, but I declare to you in the mighty name of Jesus, you're your days of slavery, your days of bondage, your days of blindness, your days of being silenced are over. It is time for you to find your seat, sit down, and speak up. So stand up then. Father, I'm very grateful for your word because I know the power of your word. I've been watching you take words just like this message today and change people's lives all my life. In fact, you've done it for me a million times. And so today in the mighty name of Jesus, I release with the authority that I have been given in this house, with an apostolic mandate in this house, with the rod and the staff in my hand, in the mighty name of Jesus, I declare that the days of the domination of evil spirits is over. And in the name of Jesus, we cast out devils and we say go in jesus name and we bring deliverance and we bring liberty and we bring freedom and most of all in the mighty name of jesus we release authority and i say in jesus name such as i have i give to you 
receive the authority of your domain in Christ and begin walking in that authority and stop thinking you've got to dial 1-800-CALL-A-PREACHER every time you need somebody to speak a word. Or stop thinking you need to go down and get a prophet. I'm, I'm grateful for prophets. I believe in prophetic ministry. But I'm telling you right now that you have the word. It is near you. It is in your mouth. And if you will begin to speak the word of God, you can bind evil spirits that plague you. Okay, so who in the room right now, who in the room right now has actually been dealing with the spirit of demonic torment? I want you to be bold and lift your hand and say... I've had a spirit of demonic torment. Okay, there's several with their hands raised right now. In the name of Jesus, I speak to you right now, and I say that your answer lies in recognizing the authority that you carry. Authority is not abracadabra. It's not one and done. You're going to have to continue to speak it. But here's what I say to you. Start with praise. Start with praise. Get glory in the middle of your suffering. Start with praise. And then let that praise break into prayer. And then take that prayer and turn it into prophecy. Worship is not complete until praise becomes prayer and prayer becomes prophecy. You need to prophesy over your own life. I'm telling you, it is, it is wonderful for you to find someone who will prophesy for you. But until you learn to prophesy for yourself, the victory will never take root. So I deputize you. Yep. How, everybody in the room, lift your right hand. Y'all ready to be deputized? In the name of Jesus, I'm deputizing you as a, as a company of prophets. Do you know your own name? Do you know your name? Say this with me. I, say your name. I, we're going to do it again. Steve Pixler, I, Steve Pixler, you say your name, not mine. I, Steve Pixler, am a, am a prophet of the Most High God. And I will prophesy into my world the authority of Christ in Jesus' name. Not everyone is called to be a prophet in the ecclesia, but everyone is called to prophesy. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. It's the will of God that you speak life over your own life. So... I started, to, I started to have you reach in your mouth and grab your own tongue, but I'm not going to do that to you. But the next time your lying tongue starts speaking what the devil wants to say over you, grab that tongue in the name of Jesus and say, Yea, I say unto thee, Nay, you will not speak the words of the enemy over my life, but I will get in my seat and I will speak up. All right. Good preaching, Steve. Thank you very much. Whew.